Is there such a thing as a feminist sport? The value of sports in general would seem to be anathema to the values of feminism. It's too masculine, too aggressive, too competitive, etc. But I think that we can all agree that there is one sport that falls under the umbrella of feminism, not because of any inherent values or anything, but more just because of its position in the zeitgeist. And, come on, you know what it is. Roll clip. Here's Stadium, where our women basketball teams play. We know can dunk, but good fundamentals. That more fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you're killing me. Oh, God, you're killing me. Now, before we get into this, it's important to note that I don't care about basketball. I don't care about women's basketball slightly more than I don't care about men's basketball, but that's not saying much. Also, as we'll see by the end, this video isn't really about basketball or sports or anything like that. This video exists because I think that I have found a story that exemplifies a lot of what is wrong with feminism. But first, let's go over the details of the story. Now, this controversy, such as it is, doesn't seem to be a big controversy. This isn't likely to be something that spills over into the national quote-unquote conversation, but I think that there's lessons to be learned nonetheless. So, the University of Connecticut's Lady Huskies are apparently one of the best women's basketball teams in the NCAA. Since 1985, they have won, by my count, no less than 11 NCAA tournament championships and a lot of other titles and accolades outside of that. They just lost this year's title to South Carolina, but only after winning the previous 111 games in a row. They are considered one of, if not the best basketball teams in women's sports. The number one reason for that, as best as I can tell, is the head coach of the team. Dino Oriema has coached the Huskies since 1985. Not only did he turn around one of the worst teams in college sports, but he is widely credited as being one of the major figures in turning women's basketball into something of mainstream credibility. Without his contributions, it's possible that women's basketball wouldn't have been able to go pro. All this is to say that Gino Oriema has done more to promote both women's sports and women in general than most of the people who could even potentially watch this video, let alone will actually watch it. Certainly he's done more than the person who made it. But Gino Oriema has come under fire recently for saying something that upset some feminists. See, you may think it's weird that a, bas a women's basketball team is coached by a man, but the thing is, it's not. Not statistically. All women's athletics programs across the NCAA are coached by women at a rate of about only 40%. Division I women's basketball stands at 58%, which is on a downward trend from 63% 10 years ago. This is a trend that has been steadily taking shape ever since Title IX was passed, which is to say that ever since colleges were required by law to promote women's sports as much as men's, more men have been entering into it. So why might this be? Well, when asked in a press conference, Gino Oriema gave his opinion on the matter in a pretty straightforward way. Quote, Not as many women want to coach. It's quite that simple. He went on to say that women have more opportunities now for a normal life, and why would they even want to, quote, sit in a gym with 400 other coaches and watch 17-year-old spoiled blats play? Now, that would seem to be a pretty straightforward, simple explanation. It may not be the end-all, be-all explanation, but it seems fairly logical, right? Well, Sally Jenkins at the Washington Post didn't think so. After expressing her desire to swing her purse at him, she points out that there are several things that may also provide an explanation. And I'll admit that I can't completely discount what she says. In life, things are really simple enough for one catch-all explanation, but I find some of the things that she says to be rather dubious. One of the explanations that she reports is actually given by coach Tara Vanderveer. Which essentially it goes, women don't get rehired after losing a job, but men tend to. And Jenkins provides as an example of this, South Carolina's Melanie Balcombe, who didn't find a job until months after being let go from Vanderbilt. However, this example is not especially compelling, as an AP article mentions that she had various offers almost immediately after losing her job at Vanderbilt. But Sally Jenkins mentions another explanation. She doesn't expound on the implications, but she notes that of all NCAA athletic directors, i.e. the people who actually do the hiring, 88% are male. And this gets into what I really want to talk about. Why are men almost entirely represented at the top of just about any remotely prestigious institution. Why is it that as women's sports has gained more notoriety, 
more and more men have gotten involved and risen to positions of influence and leadership. Is it because of gender discrimination? Is it because women have been socialized to be submissive and thus don't pursue positions at the top? We've heard Sally Jenkins' answer to this question. Now let's hear another point of view. Steve Goldberg is the now retired chairman of the Department of Sociology at City College, City of New York. In 1977, in response to the growing tide of second wave feminists claiming that gender was a social construct, he wrote a book called The Inevitability of Patriarchy. And he wrote an updated version in 1999 that was titled Why Men Rule. In the book, Goldberg makes a case that every single society that has ever existed was male dominated. And even the supposed counterexamples, he claimed, were not in fact true matriarchies. They were still male dominated patriarchies in the sense that all of the societal institutions of these societies were almost entirely male. The cases in which women rose to the top were statistically unimportant examples that really only served to demonstrate how otherwise exceptional these cases were. His take on why this seemingly universal phenomenon happens is a rather in-depth, scientific, dry, and more than a little boring explanation. The best I can tell, it amounts to men are hardwired to succeed. They are hardwired by biology to succeed and rise to the top. This seems to happen from because of the way that the XY chromosome is formed in utero. Now, I would be lying if I said I fully understood it, but this neuroendocrinological process primes men to be more aggressive and more ambitious. Hashtag not all. Just anecdotally, some of the most driven and capable people that I have known have been women, whereas I personally suffer from an almost crippling lack of ambition. However, those driven, capable women that I mentioned aren't going to be competing against me in whatever endeavor they pursue. They're going to be competing mostly against the 10% or so of men that are hyper-ambitious and willing to sacrifice almost anything to succeed. Woody Allen once said that 80% of success is just showing up, which belies an important point about success. It's not really about ability. It's about putting in the time and putting in the effort and schmoozing with the right people and dedicating hours and hours of your off time to whatever endeavor that it is. According to Professor Steve Goldberg, men are more likely, by nature, to do this. And they are more likely to, to do this specifically in the areas of life which have garnered the most prestige and the most importance. This explanation does not discount that discrimination based on sex probably can and does happen. But that doesn't mean that that discrimination is the ultimate cause of the disparity. Even in uber-feminist Sweden, which by most measures has roughly equal parity between the sexes, men are still overwhelmingly represented at the top of boardrooms and government. And now we get to why this story really caught my eye. One of the big things that feminism uses to justify itself is the fact that women are so underrepresented at the top of society's most important institutions. But we have now an explanation as to why this happens that leaves really no room for feminism as a political force to do anything about it. If Professor Goldberg is right, men are at the top because nature has built men that way, and it's likely that this will never change. The day it does change, it may very well be said that we are no longer homo sapiens, but rather have evolved into some new species where sex manifests in a different way from almost any other mammalian species. And yet feminism persists. And in trying to bring about its gender-neutral utopia, in which men and women are equally represented at everything, all throughout society, except, of course, the things that women are supposedly better at, it strains relationships between the sexes and causes resentment and entitlement in women. We can look at studies that prove that women's levels of happiness have been steadily declining for years to see the wages of feminism, but let's look at a more pertinent example. This tweet was written about Coach Oriyama after he made his statements about women coaches. Just look at it for a minute. It's a pretty standard regurgitation of feminist progressive mantra, right? Now, who do you think posted this? It wasn't some celebrity or anybody famous, but it was someone of tangential importance to this affair. Got your answer yet? The answer is, it was the man's own daughter. Ali Oriyama is an adjunct professor specializing in women's studies at the University of Connecticut. She tweeted this out after angrily tweeting, 
Dad, walk it back. She did admittedly defend her father from accusations that he's anti-woman, but then she tweeted out the previously mentioned tweet. Which is to say that her commitment to feminism caused this woman to participate in the social shaming of her own family. Of her own father, who has done more for women than probably any feminist born in the last hundred years. She even kind of compared him to Trump, which in her mind would be an insult. Now, I doubt that the Oriema family was greatly strained by this supposed controversy, but the question that I have is this. What kind of ideology would cause a person to publicly engage in the pressuring of their own family to conform to it? Jesus Christ once said, Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And he meant even and especially between members of a household. But at least the sword that he brought was one of truth and redemption. Where is the redemption in that tweet that Ali Oriema put out? It doesn't matter how much her father has done for women or will do for women. He will always be a white cisgendered man. Taken literally, Ali Oriema's tweet means that it is impossible for her father to ever truly have a grasp of what might be called truth because of his race and gender. Now, I don't know if he ever did publicly log back his statement, and it really doesn't matter to me if he did or not. But even if he did, even if he publicly prostrated himself to the ideals and goals of feminism, he would never be anything other than a cisgendered white man, even in his own daughter's eyes. He would always have to try to work through that. True equity between the sexes is neither possible nor desirable. And the human wreckage created on the ill-fated path to try and achieve this utopia has been truly staggering. Feminism acts like a force for social good and a political force for change. But in practice, especially in the last 50 years, it has only manifested as a cult that plays to the absolute worst instincts and resentments of women. And it is time to put it to bed. This is Unranked Chevron, signing off.